Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. Welcome once again to our midweek Bible study. We welcome those of you here in the sanctuary, as well as those who are joining us virtually. We pray that the Lord is continuing to bless you and keep you, and that he is shining his richest blessings upon you. At this time, let us go to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, as we come to you at this hour of the day, we thank you for another day. We thank you for all the blessings that you have bestowed upon us beyond that which we deserve. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your saving power, which was granted unto us by the death of your son Jesus on the cross. We thank you that he didn't stay on the cross, he didn't stay in the tomb, but on that third day he arose with all power in heaven and earth in his hand. Amen. We thank you for your comfort of the Holy Spirit, the one who leads us in the path that you would have us to go. For your word tells us as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the children of God. And before we go any further, as we come this evening, anything that we have done or anything that we've neglected to do that is in your sight sin and evil we come confessing repenting father thank you for the blood of jesus because without that precious blood there would be no forgiveness of sin so as we come confessing and repenting we know heavenly father that you are faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness right now father we come lifting up our leaders, our world leaders at every level, that you will touch their hearts and touch their minds. We pray a special prayer for Ukraine and that you will continue to watch over that land, Heavenly Father. We also pray for the people of Russia who are also involved in this situation. Lord God, we just pray that you will show yourself mighty and show yourself strong. No matter what is going on, we acknowledge that you are still God and you are still sovereign. Amen. Father, we come lifting up those families who are in bereavement, those father, those people who are going through a time of trouble, those who are sick, those who are shut in, those who are locked behind prison walls, that you will touch them in a special way. We pray that you will continue to be a hedge of protection around our military, for our first responders, for our frontline workers in every level and in every area that you will just touch them, Heavenly Father, as they continue to do the jobs that they do so that we might enjoy the quality of life that we have. Yeah. Lord, we come lifting up your church before you, every church that is open in your name. Father God, from the pulpit to the door, that you will let your blessings flow, that you will let your anointing flow. Father, that we will be beacons of light shining in a dark and sinful world. Mm -hmm. Father, we pray right now as we go into this time of study that you will open up our hearts, open our minds, open our spirits to receive a word from you on tonight. That your word will not return unto you void, but it will prosper in the thing where you send it and accomplish that which you please. Now, Lord, let the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight. O oh, Lord, our strength and our redeemer. And if there's anything we fail to ask, we pray in the name of Jesus that you will not fail to grant. As we continue to acknowledge all the honor, glory, and praise belong to you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 And if there is anyone else who would like to say a word of prayer before we move into our Bible study, you may do so at this time. Okay. And we will invite your attention to the Epistle of Jude. There is only one verse, I mean one chapter in the epistle of Jude. So when I put Jude the first chapter, that's actually 
so that we might be clear that I wasn't saying that we're looking at chapters 22 and 23, but verses 22 and 23. There is only one chapter in this particular epistle. <clears throat> and somewhat continuing from our theme on this past Sunday, And verse 22 of Jude says, And of some have compassion, making a difference. And others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. So on this evening, for a few moments, we are going to speak from the subject, Compassion That Makes a Difference. Compassion that makes a difference. Mm. As we were sharing on Sunday, when Jesus had gone around teaching, he saw the multitudes and he was moved with compassion. And as we saw on Sunday, compassion is a very deep sorrow or a connection with someone who's going through something. But not only is it a sorrow or a feeling of sympathy for someone who's going through, but compassion is also accompanied by a strong desire to alleviate the suffering that someone is going through. And as we look to Jesus as our example, we find that Jesus showed compassion on multiple occasions in the, the gospel, Jesus showed compassion. And again, I alluded to our message from this past Sunday where Jesus showed compassion for the multitudes in Matthew chapter 9 and verse number 36, where the scripture tells us, but when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. So Jesus was moved with compassion, but again, compassion is not just looking at somebody and feeling sorry for them. Compassion says, I'm going to do what I can in order to help alleviate the suffering, in order to help ease the burden of someone else. So as we continue to look in that ninth chapter of Matthew, we find that Jesus went on to tell his disciples to pray the Lord of the harvest that he might send laborers into his harvest because the harvest is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Amen. So that's one example of Jesus showing compassion. We find another example in Matthew chapter 14 and verse number 14. And once again, we see Jesus looking at a multitude. And what happened in verse 14 when Jesus saw a great multitude. He was moved with compassion and he healed the sick. But that wasn't the only thing he did because if we keep reading in that particular passage, the evening came and the folk got hungry. In verse 15, the disciples came to Jesus and said, it's time to send these folk home. So they can go home and get some food for themselves. But Jesus still having compassion. What did he tell them to do in verse number 16? Jesus said to them, they do not need to go away. He gave them something to eat. 
Okay, so sometimes we have compassion for people or call ourselves having compassion for people, but our compassion or our sympathy stops at acknowledging the fact that they are going through something. Mm -hmm. So the disciples said, oh, we'll just send them home so they can get something to eat. Mm -hmm. You know how we do sometimes. We feel so sorry for people, but we don't want to do anything for mm -hmm. them. But then, as we keep reading, in verse 17, they say, we just have two fishes and five loaves. Jesus said, bring me what you have. So when you have compassion, sometimes we might, anybody ever felt a need to help somebody, but you didn't feel like you had enough money, you didn't feel like you had enough resources so instead of just trying to use the little bit that you had, you decided that there wasn't anything you could do to help. Hmm. But remember, compassion says, I'm going to make a difference. Compassion says, I'm going to do what I can to help somebody. So somebody might need $50, but you only have five. Well, go ahead and use the five to the glory of God. And when you get a few more people, you get nine more people who give five, then now that person has the 50. So don't ever underestimate what God can do with your little bit, because we know the end of the story, don't we? What did he do with those two fish and those five loaves of bread? He fed the multitude. 5,000 men plus women and children. And not only that, but after they used what they had, after they used the little bit that they had, there was still 12 baskets left over. Hmm. Why? Because not only did they see the need, but compassion said, we're going to use what we have to meet the need. I've heard it said this way before. God will take your natural and add a super to it. So then you have something that happens in the supernatural. Two fish and five loaves of bread, a little boy's lunch. But yet, Jesus was able to use that to feed a multitude. And when we look at Matthew chapter 15 and 32, we have another case of a multitude. And Jesus is teaching, preaching, healing, just like he did in the previous example. So in verse number 32, what do we see once again? Matthew chapter 15 and verse number 32. Then Jesus called his disciples unto him and said, I have compassion upon the multitude because they continue with me now three days and have nothing to eat, and I will not send them away. Fashion, lest they faint in the way. Yeah, that's what we do sometimes. We can be in a position to do something, but we feel like we don't need to do it, and we go away. Mm -hmm. But if you got compassion, you ain't gonna leave. You're gonna find something to compensate for whatever the person needs. That's right. And it's interesting that that you would make that statement. Deacon Harold, and I'll just reflect on what we were talking about before <laughs> the Bible study started. Mm -hmm. Even when I had a working lawnmower <laughs> and the ability to get on that lawnmower and cut my own grass, you decided to fire me from taking care of my own yard. <laughs> It wasn't because I couldn't, mm -hmm. 
But he came over and saw <clears throat> how I had <clears throat> cut my grass and had compassion and, and, and told me not to fool with that yard anymore. <laughs> but he could have just said, well, he got a lawnmower. He can take care of that for himself. He grown. That, but the, like, like Deacon Harold said, that's what we do sometimes. We look at what people are doing and we just don't want to fool with it, even though we may have the ability to help out. So once again, the disciples are saying, we don't have enough to do this. So Jesus says, what do you have? Jesus is not asking us what we don't have. Mm -hmm. His question is always, what do you have? He said, well, all we have is a few loaves, and, or seven loaves, and a few little fishes. But what happened? Jesus said, go ahead, sit them down. Gave thanks for what they had. And then everybody ate with some to spare. Some people may be wondering as they look at the number of people who are in Good Hope Baptist Church right here in little old Smithville. Hmm. They might look around and wonder how in the world does that little church come up with all these to-go plates with some to spare. Hmm. That's because we give God what we have. Mm -hmm. And it's not just limited to us. Anybody who is willing to give God what you have, mm -hmm. he will take your little bit. When there's a song that says little becomes much mm -hmm. when you place it in the master's hand. So what happens, the first motive was compassion. I see that there's a need and I'm identifying with the need of the people, but I'm not just going to stop at identifying with their need, but I'm going to do something about it so that by the time this incident is over, their need will have been met. Another way to look at compassion is to think about if you were in that person's position, what would you want them to do for you? If you're hungry, would you want somebody to say, I'll pray for you? <laughs> Give me some food. Have that same compassion. Well, you might not be able to go over to Chunk Cypress Inn and buy them a seafood dinner. Hey, you might be able to go to Southern Classic and get them a few pieces of chicken. Or Popeyes. Yeah. Use what you have. That's all Jesus was showing them. Use what you have. As we look at Mark chapter 6, verse 34, it's just another one of the accounts of what we saw. It's a Mark's account of what we saw in Matthew. Jesus saw the multitude. He was moved with compassion because they were like sheep without a shepherd. He taught them. He fed them spiritually. But he didn't stop with feeding them spiritually because as we keep reading in Mark chapter 6, he goes on to say, these people are hungry. Let's give them something to eat. And he took care of the spiritual and the physical needs of the people. And that's an important point for us to grasp a hold of. Mm -hmm. We don't need to just be satisfied with meeting either or. 
Because sometimes we meet the physical need, but we don't meet the spiritual need. Other times we meet the spiritual need, but we don't meet the physical need. But what did Jesus do in all of these cases? He met both. He taught them. He fed them spiritually. But when he saw that they were hungry, he didn't stop with just feeding them spiritually. He fed them physically. And he didn't see that they were hungry and just give them some fish and some bread. But he also made sure that, that their souls were fed. Yes. Yes, Lord. So, for the multitudes, Jesus showed compassion. But he didn't just show compassion for the crowd. Let's look at Matthew chapter 20. So what does Matthew chapter 20 verse number 34 let us know? touched their eyes, and immediately their eyes received sight, and they followed him. So Jesus had compassion. If we back up verse number 30, two blind men, when they heard Jesus passing by, they cried out to him, have mercy on us, O Lord, thou son of David. But the multitude told them to be quiet. But the more they told them to be quiet, the more they cried out. Jesus asked them, what do you want? They said, "They, Lord, open our eyes. So Jesus had compassion on them, touched their eyes, they received sight, and they followed him. So compassion took care of their physical need, but what do you think happened when they followed him? They were spiritually, they were spiritually fed. They couldn't have followed him and not have been spiritually fed as well. So sometimes the crowd will tell you, you don't need to help them. Leave them alone. Don't bother. <laughs> Don't bother him anymore. He, he's got too much <laughs> on his plate already. But the more the crowd told them to be quiet, it was like the compassion in Jesus overtook what the crowd was saying. Mm -hmm. So what does compassion do? Compassion doesn't always follow the crowd. Mm -hmm. Many times, compassion goes against the crowd, especially in this age that we live right now. We're folk concerned about three people, me, myself, and I. Mm -hmm. Don't have compassion for somebody else. But thank God that we, we don't go with the crowd. But we are to have compassion. Our next example of Jesus showing compassion. Mark chapter 1, verse number 
So a leper, somebody who wasn't even supposed to be out in public. Because in that day, the lepers were supposed to separate themselves from everybody else. Mm -hmm. And if they did come in contact with the public, if anybody came near, they were supposed to cry out, unclean! Mm -hmm. Unclean! There are some folk who, according to the world, don't even deserve to be around us. But yet, this leper who did not even by law have the right to be in the presence of Jesus came to Jesus and said, please make me clean. And instead of Jesus looking at him and saying, you leper, you're not even supposed to be around me. Go away. Jesus saw his condition. He was moved with compassion. Mm -hmm. And by the time Jesus got finished with that leper, what happened? As soon as Jesus spoke, the leprosy departed from the man and he was clean. Oh, yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah. He was cleansed physically. Then Jesus told him in verse 44, don't say anything to anybody, just go show yourself to the priest mm -hmm. so that you may be cleansed according to the law. That you may give your offering for being cleansed. Mm -hmm. But the man who was physically clean couldn't keep his mouth shut. So he went and told everybody who would listen about Jesus. It says in verse number 45, it was so much that Jesus couldn't even openly go into the city. But had to go hang out in the wilderness. But yet, folks still came to him. Now there were some folk who were just looking for a physical healing. I mean, let's be real about it. But when we have compassion, we will not just be satisfied with seeing people overcome their physical condition, but also their spiritual condition. Yes. Continuing the Gospel of St. Mark, chapter 5, verse number 19. Jesus, so we're talking about the in the Gadarenes, the demoniac who was possessed by the spirit legion. And those of us who are familiar with this story know that this man was doing all kinds of crazy stuff. But yet when Jesus showed up, the demon recognized that Jesus was on the scene. And Jesus called that spirit out. And we see that Jesus called the spirit out. Now he had compassion on the man. Mm -hmm. <sighs> he even gave the demon a break. Because the demon said, don't just cast us out. But let us go into the swine. Mm -hmm. So Jesus said, okay, go ahead, go into the swine. But then the swine ran off a cliff. <laughs> <laughs> but at any rate, in verse 19, Jesus did not just simply say, go and tell your friends how I healed you. 
But he said, go and tell them how I had compassion on you. I saw your condition. I identified with your pain, but I didn't stop there. I did what I could to relieve your suffering. Yes. So in every situation that we've looked at, what do we see? That Jesus' compassion caused him to make a difference. Jesus' compassion caused him to take action. We can keep going in Mark 9 and 22. There was a boy who was possessed with a deaf and dumb spirit. And the father came to Jesus and said, have compassion on us. Because both the father and the son were being impacted by the fact that their son was possessed with a deaf and dumb spirit. But this father asked Jesus to have compassion on us and help us. So even the father had enough sense to say, I don't need you to just feel sorry for me. Do something about it. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yeah. So what did Jesus do? He had compassion. He called the spirit out. And even though the spirit tried to tear that young man up, because how many of you know that the devil didn't want to let go of you when you got saved? And if you don't believe he didn't want to let go of you, how many of you know he's still trying to pull you back? Mm -hmm. <laughs> trying to make you do something all out of your newfound spiritual Christian character. Mm -hmm. <laughs> then our last example that we're going to go over this evening is in Luke chapter 7 and verse number 13. Jesus encountered a funeral procession. In verse number 13. And when the Lord told him, he had compassion on her. And said unto her, Weep not. And when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her, and said unto her, Weep not. But let's look at the background here. There was a widow in the city of Nain. And in that city, there was a dead man carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. In that day, that meant she was in pretty bad shape because she had no means of support. She was a widow. So that meant her husband was gone. But her son was there to take care of her. Because if we look back at the culture of that day, it was a, a patriarchal society where the men did the work, the men took care of the family. The women by themselves, if they did not have a man to take care of them, if they did not have a husband or a son or a kinsman redeemer, they were in pretty bad shape. So let's look at this woman. Her only child has passed away. Mm. And when we look at the natural order of things, the child is not supposed to precede the parent in the natural order of things. Mm. But yet, she's grieving the loss of her son. She's grieving the fact that her only remaining support is being carried out of town to be entombed. Hmm. A lot of people in verse 12 were with her. But yet, it was Jesus who showed up and had compassion on her. And he told her not to weep. But look at compassion. What happened in verse number 14 when Jesus had compassion? He came. He 
touched the casket. He said to the man, young man, arise. And he that was dead sat up and began to speak and he delivered him to his mother. So Jesus' compassion said, woman, I see your pain. But I'm not just going to cry with you. We're going to do something about it. So he delivered the widow's son back to her. So if we're going to be like Jesus, we ought to show compassion like Jesus showed compassion. Oh, yeah. And when he did, he didn't just sit around feeling sorry for people. But he did something about it. Even when it seemed like there wasn't much available for him to use. Mm. Two fish, five loaves of bread. Or seven loaves and a few fish. Whatever was there. His compassion said, I'll just use what you got. Mm. So to recap, compassion is not just feeling sorry for somebody, but doing what you can to alleviate their suffering. Compassion says, I might not have everything you need, but I will use what God has given me. Remember Peter and John? When they encountered the lame, lame man, they had compassion. And they said, we don't have silver and gold, but we'll give you what we do have in the name of Jesus. So compassion, give them what you do have. So we'll pause here. Does anybody have any questions, comments, or concerns before we go on? So not only do we see in the Gospels where Jesus showed compassion, but in his parables, Jesus used other characters to illustrate his compassion. So in Luke chapter 10, and we know the story in Luke chapter 10 of the good Samaritan. Mm -hmm. The good Samaritan. You know, the Jews didn't like, wouldn't like that label. Because in their mind, there was no such thing as a good Samaritan. Mm -hmm. But in verse number 33, we see the man who had been beaten and robbed, stripped of his clothes. Priest came by and went on the other side. Levi came by and went on the other side. But in verse number 33, what happened? But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him. Okay. So, again, we see someone who is having compassion. Now, the, the other two who passed by might have felt sorry for the man. But their lack of action showed that they didn't have compassion. But then along comes a half-breed. Hmm. Someone who, the Jews didn't even like to go through Samaria, let alone associate with Samaritan. You know, like, those folk who, if they if they see you on this side of the church, they're going to go down the aisle on that side of the church. You know. <laughs> because you're just not worthy <laughs> of my attention. <laughs> but the Samaritan, not only did he have compassion, but as we keep reading in verse 34, he went to him, bound up his wounds, set him on his beast, took him to an inn, took care of him, and then when he left, he gave the innkeeper more money to say, take care of him, and anything beyond what I gave you, I will repay you when you come again. 
So here we have a case where the Samaritan had the necessary means to follow through on his compassion, and he used what he had, but not only did he use what he had at the time, but he said, whatever else. Because he saw a need, he saw the suffering, and he used what he had to alleviate the suffering. Stay in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 15. The story of the prodigal son. went home after he had gone to a far country and wasted all of his, sub, his substance on wine, women, and song. <laughs> Ended up in the hog pen, wanted to eat the pig slop. But he came to his senses and said, I'm going to go back to my father's house. Even though I'm not worthy to be called a son, I'm going to go back as a servant. So after everything this rascal had done, figured he was just too grown to be in his daddy's house anymore. Hmm. Reminds me of somebody else I know. <laughs> thought I was so grown. I'm moving to New Jersey. I'm grown. I know what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. Until about two or three months later, I had to call. <laughs> ah. But in verse number 20 of Luke chapter 15, when this no good, no count, hard-headed boy came home, what happened? Luke 15, 20. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. So the father's compassion, first of all, when he was a Great way off, his father saw him. So how was his father going to see him when he was off in the distance? Apparently, the father had not given up on him. <laughs> and he was still looking for him to come back home. It didn't matter. How, many, how many of you parents have experienced something like that? Where one of your children went away, it might not have been a physical far country, it could have been a mental, an emotional, a spiritual far country. And instead of giving up on them, you kept looking for them to come home. And when they came home, you didn't go through and rehearse with them everything they had done wrong, but you had compassion, and you were just so glad He had rehearsed his speech. Father, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son because I have sinned against heaven and I've sinned against you. And Father said, I don't want to hear that. Hmm. Then he called for a great feast. In other words, his compassion did not just cause him to be glad that his son was home, but compassion said, I'm going to restore you. You're not coming in as a servant. You're coming in as a son. Look at God. How many of us did not deserve to be welcomed as a son or a daughter of God? But he was looking. As a matter of fact, how far off we were we? While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us over 2,000 years ago. I say 2,000 years ago, it was longer than that because in Revelation, John said, I beheld the lamb who had been slain from the foundation of the earth. So even before mom and daddy thought about getting together, God had already looked for us in 
the distance so that he could welcome us back as his children. Because he had compassion on us and as long as we were willing to come back and humble ourselves before him. His compassion, he didn't just feel sorry for us, but he gave us the ability to as many as believed on him. To them gave he power to become the sons and the daughters of God. So the good Samaritan and the father of the prodigal son demonstrated the compassion that Jesus had. So what about us? We too are called to have compassion. First Peter chapter 3 and verse number 8. Peter saying, be of one mind, have compassion one of another, love as brethren, be tenderhearted, be courteous. So as believers, we should be of the same mind one toward another. Well, I know some of us. <clears throat> I know some of us have messed up more than others. Oh, yeah. mm-hmm. And then some of us act like we haven't messed up more than others. But we should be in a position where when we see a brother or a sister going through something, Tell the truth. What do we say? Tell the truth, shame the devil. Sometimes when people are going through, they're more comfortable staying away from the church Uh than they are coming to the church. Mm -hmm. Part of the reason that that happens in some situations is because they feel like if they come to the church, and people know what they're going through, that they're going to be judged. But compassion says, there but for the grace of God go I. It could have been me. And in some cases, the only difference between me and somebody else is that their stuff is out there, but mine is still in the closet. So if I'm going to have compassion, I need to treat somebody else like I would want to be treated when my stuff comes. Well, if you ain't got no stuff, I'm not talking to you. But if you got some stuff that you've gone through, if you've been through some things that nobody else knows about, but you and the Lord, and you know how folk would give you the side eye if they knew what you had been through. Then when you encounter somebody who has gone through, have compassion. Love as brethren. Have a heart that reaches out. Now, instead of posting on Facebook, Mm -hmm. instead of using the other social media apps to pull somebody down. How about doing something to bring them up? Because what does compassion do? Compassion identifies with what somebody is going through, but also does what is necessary to alleviate the pain and the suffering that they're going through. So this should be the last place where somebody comes when they're going through and they leave more injured than they were when they came in. We all know some church folk. Hmm. 
You do know that all church folk ain't Christians, right? We all know some church folk. We all know some holier than thou folk, don't we? Who act like they've never done anything. But we know. We know. As, as my late cousin Barbara Coleman used to say, we all have the 411 on our set. <laughs> we should have compassion for the less fortunate. And we, we shared this scripture before too in 1 John chapter 3 and verse number 17. Is that 1 John? 1 John chapter 3. Chapter 3? Oh, okay. And verse 17. And verse 17. But whoever has this world's good and see his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide? Okay. So we see in verse 17. The King James says, Whoso hath this world's good and seeth his brother have need and shuts up his bowels of compassion, which is translated heart in, in that version, from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? When we see somebody going through, I said it earlier, here we go again. If we see somebody who's hungry and we have the means to allow them to put something in their belly, Let's not look at how much we don't have, but what we do have. Because we have compassion. What, what, what do you do when your stomach is growling? You try to put something in there to stop. I was sitting at my desk today at work, and I was doing some training, I'm just trying to hold out. Had my earphones in, I could barely hear the training video because my stomach was growling so loud. And I can't wait till I get the end of the, to the end of this training because as soon as it's over, it's Whopper Wednesday too. <laughs> Even though it went up to $3 now. But anyway, Used to be one. But even though it went up to three, well, actually, I did not end up getting a Whopper. I just got a hamburger. Oh. Hey, yeah, started getting excited too quick. But if I had wanted that $3 Whopper, I was not going to be deterred because I was hungry and I wanted something to eat. No. Well, if I have compassion for somebody else and I know they need something to eat and I have the $3 to get them a Whopper instead of the regular $5 that it is during the week, I don't know too much about fast food, y'all. But I'm going to do what I can. <laughs> instead of saying, I got mine, now you get yours. We are called to have compassion for those who are less fortunate than us. Yes, Lord. Amen. And finally, when we encounter people who are weak in their faith, we should have compassion on them. So now, the, the scriptures that we started with, we're going to end with Jude verses 22 and 23. Uh, some have compassion, making a difference or a distinction, and others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garments spotted by the flesh. So let's look at what was going on when Jude made these statements. If you look at verse number four, it says, Certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation. Ungodly men turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. 
So you have some people who came into the church. But yet, what does it say in verse 4? That they were ungodly. Now see, I could start a whole nother round of Bible study on that. They came into the church, but they were ungodly. And instead of operating in God's grace, they were acting as though, well, since we have God's grace, we can do anything that we're big and bad enough to do. But we must understand that we're actually denying the power of God when we take his grace for granted and use it as an occasion to operate in the flesh. That is not why God gives us grace so we can just go out and knowingly live a life that is not pleasing to him or lasciviousness. <sighs> you know, I've said it before. Father, forgive me for what I'm about to do. Because I know your grace, your unmerited favor will kick in and you will give me what I don't deserve. I know your mercy will keep me and you will withhold the judgment that I am worthy of. That's not how we are supposed to live. Because we should not abound in sin so that grace can abound. The Bible says, God forbid. Mm. My Lord. But there are folks who are doing that. Mm. And not only that, but they will have people. Uh, you have people who are weak in their faith. They come to church they see some so-called child of God act in any kind of way. My Lord. So what is that baby Christian going to think when they see somebody who's supposed to be a mature Christian act in any kind of way? They're going to believe, well, if pastor can do it, hmm. and he's the pastor, and he's shown up going to heaven because he's the pastor. Don't 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 believe that. Don't 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 believe that lie. I'm not going to heaven because I'm a pastor. I'm going to heaven because I believe in Jesus Christ that He died and He rose again. My position is not what what's going to get me into heaven because in that last day He's not going to say pastor. Well done, is he? He's not going to say reverend, well done, is he? He's going to say servant. But I digress. So as a result of these folk who crept into the church, these ungodly folk who crept into the church, then when we fast forward to verses 18 and 19, then Jude writes, how that they told you there would be mockers in the last time who should walk after their own ungodly lust. These be they who separate themselves, sensual, having not the spirit. These are folk who come into church and cause division because they're acting on their own ungodly desires. Now, usually we avoid talking about things like lust because, you know, it's a subject that we don't necessarily feel comfortable talking about in the church. Mm. But lusts are not only sexual. There are other ungodly desires that folk have. Mm -hmm. Folk will come in church with the desire to have a position. Folk will come into the church with the desire to have power. Folk will come into the church and sow division because they don't like somebody. They want other people in the church to not like the person who they don't like because they have, the only way they can feel good about themselves is to pull somebody else down. There are more types of ungodly desires than just the physical. So they're operating in their flesh because they don't have 
the Spirit. But Jude is warning his readers, don't be caught up in that. You keep on building yourselves up in your faith. Keep on praying in the Holy Ghost. Keep yourselves in the love of God, looking unto the mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. And then he says, of some have compassion. Because there are some, and another translation says, have mercy on those who doubt. Because there are some people who are doubting the power of the word of God because of the way they see folk in the church acting. But for those who are really of the church, we need to have compassion on our weaker brothers and sisters. And making a difference or another way of saying that is making a distinction because there are some folk who are struggling in their faith and then there are other folk who are coming in and it doesn't matter what you say to them, they're not going to change their mind. <laughs> we have to know the difference. Which is why I said that you should be operating in the Holy Ghost. Because the Holy Spirit will give you the discernment that you need in order to make the distinction of those who you need to have compassion on because you can help them versus those who are so set in their ways. And can, I, can I be honest with you? We're not always going to know the difference. Sometimes discernment doesn't kick in the way we want it to. Sometimes in our flesh, we want to believe what ain't true. But for those who are weak in their faith, have faith, have compassion. Understand what they're going through and try to draw them on the right path. We need some real Christians to stand up. I am implying, so I may as well just go ahead and state it. Because there are some fake Christians in church. Mm. But it's the real Christians who don't want... I asked the question during the invitation, by a show of hands, how many people want to go to hell? Nobody's hand goes up because we don't want to go to hell. Uh, there's nobody here who wants to go to hell. Am I right about it? Mm. Those of you who are watching online, I don't believe you want to go to hell. But compassion says if I don't want to go, huh. then if there's somebody else, yeah. now heaven is not a place where we want to say, I'll go if I have to go by myself, because we want to try to bring somebody with us. Right. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, if you have folk who don't want to take the journey, then go if you have to go by yourself. But we don't want to go by ourselves, do we? No, no. Because we have compassion, making a difference. And others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating the garment defiled or spotted by the flesh. So when we see folk operating in error, we should love them enough. We should have enough compassion because, again, what does compassion say? Compassion doesn't say, I'm so sorry to see that you're living in sin. It doesn't stop there. I'm sorry that I see you living in sin, but I have an answer for you. I have a solution to your problem. I have a way for you to get out of your situation, and his name is Jesus. Compassion. We do some good things, some great things here on 114 CL Bradford Street. The majority of people operating are operating out of love. And the compassion is making it different. 
I mean, if I, if I were the type to stick my chest out, I go different places, visit different churches, and I have pastors coming up to me talking about, yeah, I hear you're doing a really good job at Good Hope. It's not about what I'm doing. It's yeah. about what God's doing. Yeah. Yeah. It's because the compassion that's in my heart for people and the compassion that's in your hearts for people, that's what's making the difference. That's why people are, who thought that Good Hope was down for the count are starting to see the phoenix rise up from the ashes. Why? Because we have compassion to serve people. Not just see what they're going through, but to do something about it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And as long as we keep doing that, if again, with the number that we have, if God is blessing us the way that he's blessing us to be a blessing to this community, then when we continue to do what he is calling us to do, and when we have more people, so my brothers and sisters, for those of you who are listening, who may not be a part of the Good Hope family. This doesn't just apply to Good Hope. This applies to all of us. Because Good Hope is not the church. Good Hope is part of the church. Yes. Amen. This compassion that makes a difference is something that God wants all of us to demonstrate. Mm -hmm. So let us renew our commitment to show compassion that makes a difference. Amen. Amen. Is there anything else that anyone has before we close out for the evening? Thank you so much again to those of you who are joining us online. I'm really trying to uh, have my phone up here. I'm doing some experimentation Still haven't. Love you too, Brother Eric. <laughs> Thank you, Sister Erica. I'm, I'm trying to keep my eye on the comments that are coming in. I'll try to do a better job of utilizing social media to its fullest potential. But um, I thank you for your, your support, my brother. My blood brother. My big brother. <laughs> so we're going to... Uh, do our best to continue to uh, make this more interactive as we uh, share here in the sanctuary as well as for those of you who are joining us virtually. So if, if that's all, Deacon Harold Wooden Jr., could you please close us out in prayer as we all stand together here in the sanctuary. Please, as while we come this evening, thank you for this day. Thank you for watching over us, leading us, and guiding us with the wisdom of the saints and the people you will say. For we realize that you are and that you are all by yourself. Lord, thank you for your mercy and your grace and all that love that goes along with it. We just want to thank you for being you. Thank you for blessing us and continue your blessing upon all of us. For we cannot do anything without you. Bless this blessed last son, Jesus. God bless you. Go in peace.